Good evening, British and American culture. Uh, this is now week 11, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, the title of our lecture today is The American Century. Now, this Thursday, and one student pointed out that I had written the date incorrectly, it's uh, May 14th, this Thursday, is your third assignment is due, and it will be graded this time, so you should take it um, at least as seriously as the previous two. Um, I've received a few of them, and uh, just to be clear, <clears throat> the assignment is to write about an example that fits into one of the five concepts. You don't have to try to explain them all. So if you do that, you're not going to get an A, because that was not the assignment. The assignment is to choose one. Freedom, opportunity, manifest destiny, uh, beliefs, especially religious beliefs, right? Beliefs, um, ideas and beliefs, and contradiction. Those are the five, okay? Which I explained to you um, a few weeks back. And <clears throat> I would like you to take one of those concepts, and I would like you to link it to something that's in American culture that you think is a particularly good example of one of those things. You need one example um, in detail connected to one concept. If you do a broad overview of all five of them the way I do in my lectures, then you're not going to get a good grade, okay? So it should be specific and you should choose one and you should do your own research and uh, an English reference is required. So uh, you're not going to, again, you're not going to get full credit, you're not going to get a good grade if you do not provide a source. So you need to do your research. Wikipedia is not good enough so you need to find something uh, on the internet or a book. I know probably it's going to be something on the internet, but it, it could be an ebook. It could be an article. <clears throat> um, try and find something that's reliable. You don't want a, a blog is not a reliable source. So look for something that's credible uh, in English and use that as your source of information and uh, explain how this particular example is connected to one of those five concepts. Write an entire one page <clears throat> with your reference at the bottom, put all of your information, especially your student number, most important thing, but your student number, the class, your name, and a title, and email it to me so that I can process them as fast as possible because there's 64 of you and it's gonna take forever to check them all. So please do me a favor, <clears throat> follow the guidelines, uh, do the assignment correctly, and um, then all of us will win. Now, we only have, we're at week 11, so we have three classes left, which is great. <clears throat> we're making progress. Uh, week 15 is going to be the exam, and we're going to have a, a huge classroom where you're at least one meter apart when you write the exam. Um, the big disadvantage for you is that normally you would have had, by, by now you'd be doing your sixth squi quiz, squiz, sorry. Uh, you'd be doing your sixth sixth quiz. So throughout the term, usually uh, before the midterm, I have three quizzes and after another three. So there would be six. Uh, and you would be able to use, not only would you have, uh, you know, studied for them and gotten results, but you would also be able to use them to study. But you won't have that this time. The midterm was also canceled. So you don't have that either. <clears throat> so that's a disadvantage going into the exam. However, you do have these video lectures, which you can literally, like you would never be able to listen to my lectures again because they're not recorded uh, normally. So you can literally go back through the entire class and watch every video lecture. You're probably not going to do that, but you could. Um, and if you were not clear about something, you could listen to it again. And there's subtitles and everything. So uh, we do have a great resource being online. So all of, there's an archive in the YouTube channel for you to study with. And that will be the best resource you have uh, to use for the exam. So that's something that previous classes didn't have. They had the quizzes in the midterm and you don't, but now you have full recordings of everything I've said the entire semester, which is unique, uh, at least unique in this class. So you, you have that, and um, we will have an exam review on week 14, uh, the week before, to also give you, um, you know, to help you 
touch up. Remember what I said, things that I write on the board, things that I say and I emphasize and I talk about in detail, those are the things that you need to know. You need to also read the, book, the textbook when I mention specific pages where I say, well, I don't have time to talk about this, so you have to read this from the textbook. That's also an indication that uh, you should read that section and make some notes and um, digest it and prepare for it properly, okay? So that's what things are gonna be like. Um, we have three weeks left. Uh, we are, because, I guess because of, I, I'm gonna have to say it's because of my effort, uh, we are nor ahead of what we would normally be at. I always fall behind and I have not this semester. So we're actually, I'm actually able to talk about last week's entire lecture uh, was almost all new material. So thankfully this week we're back to what I've been teaching for five years and I, I know this, this section quite well so I'll be more comfortable. Um, explaining it and breaking it down for you because there's so much information about American culture um, for you to to know and I, I know it's a lot of information so you do need to focus on certain points um, because you have other classes and you can't absorb uh, an entire lifetime of information in one class so you know this is topics in British and American culture but I think in a way a good title for this would be uh, introduction um, to British and American culture. That would be a good title for this class too because this is essentially my object. So today we're going to talk about uh, a broad overview of the entire 20th century. So this is going to overlap a little bit with what we talked about last week but um, overlapping a little bit just reinforces and helps you remember things so that's fine. Um, so I'm going to give you a, a whole let's sort of a big picture sort of uh, perspective on the 20th century uh, and uh, in the second part I'm only going to do two this week the second half of this week's lecture um, I'm going to talk about uh, Americanization um, over the 20th century also sort of a, a broad you know sort of uh, perspective on how America has American culture has spread all over the world and and what things are representative of American culture, uh, where they come from, and why we have all absorbed them, whether we've realized it or not. So, um, please hand in your assignment by Thursday, and do your best. Um, do your best to uh, write clearly and or in an organized way. Grammar is a minor factor, but your grammar has to be good enough that I can understand what you're trying to say. So grammar has to have, you know, a baseline level. If it, your grammar um, interferes with my understanding, then of course that's going to lower your grade too. But really, I'm more, I'm more interested in content and uh, logic and organization, okay? So good luck with that. Now, <clears throat> um, let me first, um, as I said, you need a reference for your assignment and uh, I should make a reference here too and and give credit where credit is due. So this is one of the textbooks that I bought originally when I first was asked to teach this class. Um, I'm very familiar with American culture, being Canadian and having <clears throat> uh, traveled there a hundred times. But uh, about, about a, an academic perspective, um, most of it, my background was in literature. So I did buy this Modern American Culture um, book. It's called The Cambridge Companion to Modern American Literature. Um, Cambridge is a pretty good university, so I figured it was worth uh, a look, and I was right. It's an excellent book. Uh, the second, uh, the part that I mostly derived this section from is chapter two. Uh, it's called The American Century, and I, I borrowed that title directly from here. Uh, that this section of the book, it's, each section is written by a different uh, professor, and this one was written by Godfrey Hodgson. And um, <clears throat> so this organization of the American century that you see up here is a very, very uh, basic summary of what he put into this thick textbook, which um, if you would like to read it, uh, I would even let you borrow it, but no student has ever asked me to see it. So... <clears throat> um, 
I'm, that's where I'm getting my information from here um, in, in, the, in the structural sense. Now, um, I have already done some summarizing in my own textbook, uh, which is, uh, I did, um, he, he is part of the bibliography of my book, and uh, in chapter 7, which we sort of put on hold, because really I only talked about the first couple pages, but now we're talking about, today we're talking about page 186, pretty much to 198. Um, Next week we'll be talking about pop culture and especially Hollywood, um, and that's that's 199 forward. But this uh, larger section of of chapter seven, from 186 to 198, is the part you need to read, um, which explains what I'm talking about today. Okay, so that's the textbook stuff. So let's get into it. <clears throat> so basically, um, Mr. Hodgson. He divides the entire American century, um, which the it was it was coined apparently it was coined by um, Time magazine coined uh, the twentieth century the American century, uh, not until you know the end of World War II. Uh, it was around 1945. The magazine ran ran an article that said it's the American century, right? Um, that's halfway through. It's a little bit late to call it the American century, but as I said, as I've been explaining, the transition um, from America being a regional power to a global power to um, coming, I said, I called one of my lectures a coming out party, um, which was a little bit of a joke, but basically that they were growing into this role, this international role, as a powerful country that needed to uh, to mediate and it needed to inter intervene um, and it needed to use its uh, presence um, to sort of officiate and negotiate and manage global affairs. Uh, and maybe this metaphor makes sense to you. It's kind of like, let's say you're in the schoolyard <clears throat> and you're the, the biggest, strongest kid and you look over, and this is, I think this is where American politicians sometimes look at it as, as, uh, as this situation. You're the biggest, strongest kid, <clears throat> um, and you're the toughest, most imitate, intimidating person. Everybody respects you, and you're standing in the schoolyard, and then uh, another kid <clears throat> who's, who's uh, being mean uh, and aggressive starts picking on another kid, and um, the other kid is shy and smaller and can't really defend himself. Are you morally obligated as this big tough guy? If you're a good person and you're a morally um, responsible person, should you walk over there and say, hey, cut it out or I'm going to knock you out? Potentially, right? Or you don't have to go that far, but you just say, stop it or else you have to deal with me. I think that's more diplomatic. I didn't mean to go too far, but you know, that's kind of way diplomat. Diplomatic things sometimes get out of control, but that's sometimes sometimes there's threats. But anyway, you just intervene and you say, "Look, if you if you pick on that guy, you got to deal with me." Um, America, lots of countries do that. Lots of people do that, and some people don't. America was in the 19th century that big strong kid potentially that um, no matter what happened around them, they tried as much as possible not to be involved. It's not their business, so they just turn their back and just focus on whatever they were doing, okay? But increasingly, they couldn't do that, <clears throat> especially when you end up with, as I said, about World War I and World War II, you end up with countries like Japan and Germany, which are not just mean kids in the schoolyard. Uh, they're kind of, <clears throat> you might say they're like psychopathic killers on the rampage, and American um, power has the ability to do something about that. And can they just watch them just wipe out a whole groups of people in the neighborhood? Or should they <clears throat> equip themselves, arm themselves, and make it stop? Well, the, the, moral, the, the, the moral obligation wasn't really enough to get them to do that, but when it became too close and, and it affected them too much personally, 
they did jump in and this changed everything. So let's just talk about, we've already dealt with that scenario. So this is what America's like now, right? <clears throat> so in World War I, um, Hodgson describes this whole situation as basically an evolution, like I said, but there's stages to it. And um, it's not a linear, don't think of it like an evolution, like you're getting better, because that's not what evolution is, right? Evolution isn't getting stronger and stronger and bigger and bigger and faster and faster. Evolution is adaptation to the situation, right? So if bigger and stronger, uh, let's say you're evolving, you're an, an organism, and you evolve and you're bigger and stronger, but there's less food uh, and there's no shade, and being small and needing less food and, and uh, hiding better is an advantage, then you die, right? That's what evolution is. Evolution is adapting to the environment. If the environment doesn't require big, strong, uh, healthy, energetic people, and it requires something else, then that's the people that, that's the group that gets wiped out, right? So what I mean by evolution is that the culture adapts to the environment as it goes. And that's why I chose evolution and revolution as my title. So we've talked about revolution um, in particular instances quite a bit, but this is a great situation where I can really show you how the evolutionary metaphor works really well with culture because America transformed, but it didn't necessarily transform for the better throughout the last 100 years. And you, can, you will see that in a minute, okay? But it changes and it has to change, right? So there is a point probably you could say, well, this is the, the height of American power and this is the best America there was. It's not 2020, most people. I mean, not very many people think the present is the best time ever anyway, but I think if you're able to look objectively, it's not this year, <clears throat> it's not the best year in American culture. Um, you can choose a lot of different dates, but it's not this year. So uh, evolution means just changing um, around the circumstances and around uh, the environment. So let's talk about that. So there's three periods, Hodgson says, there's three periods. There's the early 20th century, <clears throat> then there's a sort of crisis, a break, um, a, in, a period of instability, and then there's, you know, a, a, a second period, and then a crisis, and then a third period. This is how he describes the whole century, the American century, and how American culture um, changes. <clears throat> and I think it's the best way I've ever read to explain to you the whole 20th century in one lecture. So that's what I'm gonna do. It, it may not be perfect, but this is my, um, this is what I've relied on. So you, you have to give me this one. Um, so in the early, what happened in the 1890s, there was a very serious depression. Um, before the Great Depression in the 1930s, starting in 1929, um, everybody looked at the 1890s in the United States as the worst period in the, the economic um, history of the United States. It was a very severe depression, similar kinds of levels of unemployment, starvation, um, immigration, people moving around, not looking for work but not having anything, and, and just um, the, basically the economy um, collapsing. Uh, that happened in the 1890s. And throughout the 1900s to, the 19, to 1910, uh, there was very stagnant growth. The economy really wasn't doing very well. <clears throat> but like I said, when World War I, <clears throat> when World War I began in 1914, America was not involved until 1917 directly. So what they did is they, they supplied, um, there was a massive demand um, for all sorts of products that were related to, to uh, the war effort in Europe. So they, they didn't just sell to the, the Allies, they didn't just sell to the British and the French, they sold to the Germans, uh, they sold to the Russians, they sold to everybody, because at that point they were still sort of neutral. <clears throat> so what their attitude was is, if you want us to make you uh, bullets or rifles or leather boots or helmets, or send you food, um, you pay us, we'll, we'll send it. it. And so that um, war production demand 
from the Great War, from the World War going on in Europe, um, you know, kick-started the American economy and the American economy began to grow rapidly. Um, and this was, you know, politically one of the reasons why they didn't go in earlier because they were, I mean, it's, it's, it's called profiteering. They were making tons of money and they didn't have to risk their own money, their own um, security and their own, you know, American citizens' lives. So, yeah, they took advantage of it. Um, but at a certain point, German submarines sank uh, American shipping, started to interfere with it because they were supplying the French and the British too much, and they, the Germans thought that was unfair. Uh, so they started to sink uh, their ships, and uh, American citizens died, and so America declared war and jumped in. And then, <clears throat> you know, the they won the war. The Allies won the war and Germany was defeated. Uh, as I mentioned, there was a, a, a pandemic even worse than what we're dealing with now called the Spanish flu, which killed about 600,000 Americans, which was more, many more, than the, the number of people that died fighting in Europe in, in the actual war. Uh, so there was sort of a, an economic boom and then there was a contraction because of this pandemic. But in the 20s, in the 1920s, everything picked up again, um, despite the fact that uh, a lot of countries were severely damaged, especially Germany, Russia, and France, uh, had been severely injured, damaged by the war. And then the, the Germans and the Austrians were required to pay back money and were their economies and their militaries and their you know, politics were all sort of regulated and restricted uh, because the, the, they never allowed um, the, the defeated countries in, in Europe to recover. Uh, that was a drain on the global economy too. And um, there was in America because they didn't have suffer much damage from the war. And they, the economy was in great shape because of the demand. Um, and because everybody thought, um, everybody started to believe that uh, America was capable of all these great things. There was cars and there was, people were developing new things, radio and air, all these new technologies and air, uh, all these new technologies, particularly like radios, uh, radio, airplanes and cars, among other things. There are many other things too that, that um, developed during the war period and became products and commodities for regular people. Um, because of all this demand and all this um, energy and all this production, people started to think that stock markets went like this. And, and uh, again, remember I talked to you about, don't, don't forget the concepts. I know there's a lot of information here, but this is what modernity is. This is the problem with, with believing in uh, the idea of modernity, of being modern. That that human beings are capable of progress and that our science and our technology and our ideas are always going to um, develop and, and get better, right? So there was this optimism, that's the word that uh, Hodgson uses and that's the word that I'm gonna uh, emphasize to you too. The first 25 years, not right at the beginning, but this, this feeling of of like we're just gonna we're just gonna get better and better and stronger and stronger and the stock market is gonna go up forever. This is the attitude. Uh, so the the nickname for the nickname for the 1920s uh, is called the Roaring Twenties. Uh, because <clears throat> roaring means a loud noise and it. it if you see, you know, videos, of, they're all black and white and stuff, but you'll see people smoking and dancing and driving around in cars and smiling and laughing and, you know, uh, you know movie theater, movies were starting to develop. All kinds of new things were coming out and it seemed like a great time to be alive. Like America was just going to take off you know, to the moon. And it did for a while. But there were some fundamental problems. Like I said, Central Europe, in particular Germany, was being actively suppressed because of it lost the war. So it was not able to recover. Um, the United Kingdom and, and France 
uh, were having trouble recovering too. They had uh, immense amounts of money to spend to try and balance what they had lost. Uh, the United Kingdom, the United Kingdom, the British in particular, had basically bankrolled everybody. They had sent tons of equipment and money to Russia and to France, and they had borrowed immense amounts of money from the United States. So basically, like I said, it's like a vacuum cleaner over London, sucking up all the money from the British Empire, which is hundreds of years, basically, of accumulated wealth, and just dropping it in New York. So obviously, the Americans are feeling pretty good. Uh, they've got uh, tons of money everywhere. They're just partying, and business looks good. Everything's fine, but fundamentally, there's some problems. The financial sector starts to have problems first. Um, actually, not first, because, you know, the, there's some bad harvest, and there's some there's people in agriculture and businesses um, who run out of money and their, their, their farms fail and their, their businesses and their companies fail and so they default on their loans and the banks are lending out money all the time because they think everything's gonna go uh, well forever. You, all of you are too young um, to experience this but a similar thing happened in 2007 and 2008 uh, when the banks just lent out money to people uh, and then people stopped being able to pay for their houses and then the whole system sort of had a domino effect and almost the whole world went into recession because nobody could pay the banks. So when the banks, and there were thousands of banks uh, in America, all over the place, state banks, individual, private banks, uh, there's very few national banks, there's banks all over the place. Um, hundreds of banks, thousands and thousands of, of businesses and millions of individuals go bankrupt and they do it very quickly it starts slowly and then suddenly it just starts happening uh, faster and faster and the collapse um, comes to a head in 1929 and once um, investors realize um, that the there's no money coming in that they've invested stocks and companies and and um, businesses and um, projects that are that are, have failed, uh, everybody tries to sell their stocks and everybody tries to go to the bank and take their money out at the same time, but there's no money. So you end up with, you know, 25% <clears throat> um, of the population with no job. Um, from 1930, 1929 to 1933, um, about a quarter of the American population loses their jobs. Um, unfortunately, in the coronavirus situation, I think the American uh, unemployment rate is something around 12 or 13 percent right now because about 20 million people have lost their jobs. But um, if this was the Great Depression, uh, another 25 or 30 million people would lose their jobs. Um, so there wasn't, there really wasn't a solution to this. <clears throat> um, everybody, like I said, just like in the 1890s, people tried to move to different cities. They tried to, they, they went to soup kitchens. They sent letters to the government. They begged. Uh, they tried to make things that, you know, they, they <clears throat> tried to spend as little as possible. But, but there, was, there were uh, poor families and, and um, people hard on their luck everywhere. Uh, the, grapes, the Grapes of Wrath is a, a, by John Steinbe Steinbeck is a, a book about this story. Um, some people are traveling around the Midwest. There's these great, there's dust storms and everything, and uh, the farms won't produce and everything. Everything that could go wrong goes wrong. And so there's a lot of suffering, and uh, it, it has an impression. Um, my grandfather was Canadian, of course, but I, I remember, you know, him telling me of what it was like. Uh, his his family lost everything. Uh, earlier than the depression, but basically they traveled around trying to, um, my great grandfather tried to get work as a, as a farm assistant, working on a farm for somebody else who owned the farm. And um, the one thing I always noticed about my grandfather is that he would never throw anything out. Um, if there was an apple that was um, two weeks old and sitting in the refrigerator, he would eat it. And uh, when he ate his dinner, if he had soup or something, um, he, he, when he was, and my wife always jokes about this because I do it too, because it's a habit I picked up from my mother. But when I, when I have stew and I finish my stew, 
there's, you know, there's a little bit left there at the bottom of the bowl. And I, I take my bread and, and I clean up the, the sauce, the, the rest of the residue of the, soup, of the stew, uh, so that the, basically the bowl doesn't hardly need to be washed because there's no food on it. Um, I like the taste of the stew and I like the bread. So that was kind of my, but my, I think my grandfather did it because he was hungry. Um, he would never throw away a scrap of food because they didn't have any extra money. And um, you'll hear similar stories. If you want to ask uh, your grandparents or your parents about what your grandparents or great grandparents lived like, if you're, you know, uh, if you're Korean especially, what it was like to live during the Japanese occupation or uh, during the Korean War, there's similar behaviors. Uh, you only get enough food to, to keep you alive, and so nothing gets wasted, uh, and that, that has an effect on you. And that's what the Depression was like. Uh, they tried all kinds of different projects. Uh, in 1933, that is when um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt gets elected, essentially because um, Herbert Hoover, the president, uh, incumbent president, was a very intelligent very effective president, but he couldn't, uh, there was, you know, he didn't want to tamper with the economy. He knew there was a problem, but he wanted to let the economy run its course, but people weren't going to vote for that. Um, and um, despite his intelligence and his leadership ability and his good qualities, he lost because he was president for four years of the worst economic uh, environment in American history. So it's hard to win an election when that's, you know, that's the situation when, under your leadership. So Hoover was gone. FDR comes in uh, in 1933, but he's not really able, despite the fact that he makes this thing called the New Deal and invests in all these programs to try and rejuvenate the economy and public works and, and help people, you know, stabilize the economy and, and uh, support the banks. It really, there is no real, it, it stabilizes, but there's no U-shaped recovery is what they call it. That doesn't happen until World War II. So the depression is from 1929 until World War II. And in World War II, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, he actually gets elected four times. Uh, after he does this, <clears throat> they, they pass a law in Congress that you're not allowed to have more than two terms because that was the precedent that was set by George Washington, which everybody followed, until FDR said, well, we're in the middle of a war, so I think I should be president again. So he got elected four times, and then he died. Um, so his, his uh, vice president, Harry Truman, took over. But anyway, through the entire period of, of the World War II recovery, economic recovery, uh, it's Franklin Delano Roosevelt. The important thing about him is he's a Democrat, but basically, because there's a global crisis where millions of people are dying, tens of thousands of people are dying every day, uh, Germany and Russia and China and Japan, uh, Southeast Asia and Africa and everywhere except for America, basically, there's people dying all the time from, from abuse, from, um, you know, from attempts at genocide, from combat, from starvation. It's just a horrible, horrible thing. The longer it goes on, the more the suffering. Um, so the politicians, Republicans and Democrats, you have a Democratic president, but largely they do what they have to do. It's called the bipartisan consensus. Okay, It's the liberal consensus because it's the Democratic Party leading it, but bipartisan because both parties, two, bi means two, it's a bipartisan consensus, which means the Democrats and the Republicans basically uh, vote together and pass laws quickly, which is not normally how dem democracies work. Democracies are built to fight with themselves. Uh, they often try and block each other, especially in a two-party system. But that's not what happens for, you can say, about 10 years because of the, the economic crisis and because of the global military political crisis of World War II, you have this extended period that goes right into the 50s where uh, the president is Democrat, 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 and then Eisenhower, who is a, a general, he becomes a Republic, Republican candidate um, and he wins and he's a Republican, but a lot of Democrats are pretty on board with a lot of the things that he wants to do to speed the recovery of all the countries, Japan, Germany, 
and, and also um, Korea to a certain extent, and uh, any other programs that involve that, that, that require the, the co cooperation of the entire Congress and, and the Senate too. And this all goes uh, pretty well because the, the economy is on fire, absolutely on fire, like white hot, you know, in some cases it's growing 20% a year during this period. It's, it's uh, astronomical growth. So everybody's willing to go along with it because everybody's, I mean, it's, it's a, after World War II is over, which was a horrible, horrible thing, but America enters into this um, period of prosperity that pushes it forward towards the 1960s. But by the 1960s, you can see there's some fundamental problems in American society which are related to this thing, like I mentioned, that the contradiction is one of those five concepts. The contradiction here is that there were hundreds of thousands of African Americans and um, uh, other minorities, but particularly the African Americans, that um, they, they fought and died and committed themselves and behaved in a patriotic way in order to save freedom and to defeat Hitler and Imperial Japan, to make the world a better place, right? And then they came home and then they had to go to a separate school and they had to go to a separate bathroom and they had to go to a different restaurant and they had to go to a different train car or the back of the bus and they looked at themselves and they looked at their environment and said, like, what the, you know, you know what I'm going to say. This is messed up. I went and fought abroad for my country to promote freedom and to protect individual rights. And I come home and I don't even have it at home. Like, what was the point of what I just did? So, I mean, there's not just the African-Americans. There's all kinds of groups. It's um, all kinds of dis people who are discriminated against, you know. It's gender stuff because women have the vote too, but you know, um, there's pay gap issues. And so all of this stuff is sort of simmering uh, from 1945 onward. Even though the economy is exploding and everything's going well and everybody's got two cars and they've got a washing machine and a refrigerator and they have a TV and everything else, underneath the society is broken and it's, unf it's fundamentally unfair. And the... The, um, this bubbles over into the civil rights movement and the people that you know, uh, especially Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, as a, he was a, an African American preacher who was assassinated. He's one of the main figures that drove this movement, movement forward, but there are hundreds of thousands of people all over the place protesting for equality and um, the end of segregation and the end of discrimination against sexes, um, against you know, class discrimination, uh, and again, in particular against the, the things that we remember the most is the racial discrimination because that uh, had a, a history going back, um, you know, hundreds of years and, and it was more obvious um, and it was, it, was, it was more institutionalized and legalized than anything else. Uh, so the 1960s were uh, a period of instability and upheaval uh, and they achieved a lot. Uh, Lots of people got hurt, there was lots of protesting, but those people were, you know, those American people who made the effort should be commended because they achieved a lot and they, they, they won a lot of the rights and freedoms that uh, they deserved. So that is, that's the second crisis that follows the liberal consensus, <clears throat> right? And when that, <clears throat> when they achieved, not everything, but they achieved a lot of the things that they, they wanted, uh, the civil rights movement subsided and the the you know this co coincided somewhat with the the war in Vietnam and uh, other things that were sort of causing a lot of friction and and instability in the United States as that um, um, energy diminished the <clears throat> conservative polit political um, characteristics of the United States started to reassert itself um, and uh, I, I don't like to be too political in this class but I have to choose certain individuals that are representative um, you know Nixon um, ended up being being uh, accused and and uh, resigning because of his uh, corruption and uh, his, his the Watergate scandal 
so he's probably not the best example of, of this sort of um, transition into this conservative era. It, Ronald Reagan uh, would probably be the best. And I'm, I'm not an expert on Ronald Reagan, but Ronald Reagan was essentially an actor. Um, he was, he, he didn't end up, he wanted to fight in World War II, but he didn't. Um, because of, of certain disability, I, I can't remember if his eyesight maybe, but he wasn't allowed to fight. So then he he acted and he did some roles to like you know promote patriotic behavior, and he, he was um, um, respected as a as a patriot, even though he was unable to actually personally participate. And uh, he became a politician, and then he was elected as the Republican candidate, and um, he 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 really. Um, economically and militarily represents this 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 attitude of of um, American uh, American control over uh, the entire world. He um, he got in um, a lot of hot water for various things, uh, interfering in uh, the Middle East, in Iran, and. Uh, in in Central America with Ni Nicaragua, I, I won't go into the details, and it's not really important whether he was guilty or not, or whether he knew, or people, you know, in his government were the ones responsible. Just the fact is that he had a very active role, and he one of the things that he's most famous for is the the speech that he makes. Um, he puts pressure on the the Soviet Union to to uh, change their global policy and, and to denuclearize and to free Germany and all this kind of stuff. And, and he makes this speech where I can just remember the, the one line, which is a great line. He says that he, he's making a speech uh, about the Berlin Wall that divided Berlin from east to west. And he, he says, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And then you can just hear, you know, hundreds of thousands of German people screaming and clapping because they're just desperate to um, reunite their country and, and to, to live a more, you know, uh, to, to have a different uh, lifestyle than this sort of locked down East German communist satellite state that they've been dealing with since uh, 1945. So this is what Reagan is famous for and, and he should be given credit for that. But it's, it's an aggressive foreign policy. He puts political pressure on places and he, he, he's, you know, sending, I guess he's sending Navy SEAL teams and, and spying all over the place. And he comes up with this program called the Star Wars program where they're going to, you know, have missiles in space and like shoot at, if the, if the Russians shoot a, you know, nuclear missiles at them, then they're going to intercept them with these lasers or, or something. And all of these things create a lot of tension and, and they're aggressive, right? They're not peaceful. Um, uh, they're not diplomatic, uh, peaceful, you know, um, negotiations. They're, they're sort of forceful, aggressive positions exerting American power on the global stage. And you can see on the website, you can see some of the results of that is that you know there are there's over a hundred countries in the world that have American military presence in them. Uh, it's the American presence uh, militarily is is larger. Uh, the global presence is larger than any country uh, in the history of the world. Even the British Empire didn't have uh, that many countries with that many um, military bases and garrisons and soldiers uh, across the world. You can see by the map; it's clear. Um, so. This is sort of where the, the idea of an American empire comes along because they, they, when the Soviet Union collapses in the 1990s, you end up with America as the only superpower in the world. And this is the era of the neoconservative. Um, Ronald Reagan, George Bush Sr., Hil um, Clinton, not Hillary, Bill Clinton, George Bush Jr., uh, Obama and now Donald Trump, they, they all fit this category, whether they wanted to or not, whether they have more liberal leaning ideas personally or not, but it's the machinery and it's the, the, the politics of, the, of America itself. It's the culture of America itself to be a hyper interventionist state. And so despite the fact that Donald Trump said he was going to pull things back, he didn't. Um, and despite the fact that Barack Obama said he was going to close down Guantanamo Bay, which was a, you know, 
a secret prison in Cuba where they could put, uh, you know, um, terrorists or um, political prisoners or whoever they wanted without abiding by international law. Uh, because in the United States they wouldn't be able to torture them or manipulate them because that's illegal. He, he, he never, he promised he would close it down, but he didn't. Why didn't he? Well, I don't know. But I think there's a lot of, I mean, even when a president runs, before they get in the office, they don't realize that how much, in, how invested the United States is in this global presence that started back in the liberal consensus and now whether you're a democrat or whether you're um, a republican or you're independent i think if you got in the white house um it would be very very hard to reverse it's it's very hard to to just extract all these connections and all these uh tendrils that are spread all over the world in representing american interests so this is the America we live with now. But now we have uh, other countries, the situation, like I said, things are evolving. And uh, I've been saying for the last five years, um, from the very beginning, when I first started teaching this class, it's one of the reasons that there's so much tension between China and the United States is because China is going to um, take its place, rightful place, I'm gonna have to uh, admit, as a, a superpower and it's going to be influential in the world and the, the United States has two choices they can accept that or they can fight it and I'm gonna say that the the first option is a lot better one because um, I don't think that uh, attempting to fight the rise of a, a global superpower is going to end well for either country so obviously I'm in favor of them uh, of China gradually taking its its, its place um, as another superpower. A hundred years ago, you know, there were five superpowers, not one. So it's possible, but we, there has to be a balance between them. And this is the way American culture is right now. So uh, I think we're entering into a new era, um, whether America likes it or not, there's going to be a transition into a new American era, but I can't tell you what that's gonna be, but we're still stuck in the neocon era for now in 2020 so that covers the 20th century right up until now and now you know what uh, mr. Hodgson um, how he describes it and this is how um, I would like to explain it I, I would like to emphasize to you that those of you who are still listening to me and paying attention this is going to be on the exam uh, it's important and there's going to be questions detailed questions about this so listen to this Listen to this video lecture carefully and read the pages that I told you to in the book carefully because this is going to um, be important on the exam. It's going to be very relevant and there'll be questions that you have to be able to understand and respond to. Okay? And that is it. Um, that's the first one for this week and I'll do a part two of uh, the American Century later this week. Thank you for listening. I know this is a long one, but uh, I think two chunks is better for the rest of the week.